For more than 100 years, New York City has been the proving ground for every new idea in entertainment. Every week, new shows open on Broadway, hoping for a smash hit, big money, and instant fame. Some make it, but most fail. This great theater in the round has seen the most successful show of all, a show that has been running continuously every fall since 1925. The theater, of course, is Yankee Stadium. And the show, the New York Football Giants. Allie Sherman has been head coach of the Giants for seven years. During that time, he has played many roles. Some happy, some not so happy. In 1967, he was cast in his most familiar one, a winner. And once again, the New York Giants were the best show in town. for imaginative, offensive football. In 1967, he presented a versatile, highly polished attack, an offense of deception full of double reverses, triple reverses, and end-around plays. The Giants passed for more touchdowns than any other team in the league. They averaged more than 26 points a game. And each time they called a play, it gained an average of six yards. The giant offense was predicated on unexpected maneuvers. Perhaps a quick go for broke touchdown pass or maybe a fourth down punt formation pass play. When the Giants were trailing the Pittsburgh Steelers with two minutes to play, Sherman used the old flea flicker triple reverse and it won the game. It worked because it was totally unexpected. Much of the team's new personality comes from number 10, Fran Tarkenton. In a highly publicized off-season trade, Tarkenton came to the Giants from the Minnesota Viking. It proved to be the shrewdest trade of the year, for Francis brought along all the excitement and razzle-dazzle that had made him the talk of the league during his six seasons with Minnesota. His scrambling, gambling style added still another dimension to the New York attack. With Tarkenton at quarterback, a perfectly ordinary game of football turned into a wild afternoon of fun and games. This is Stone Mountain in Atlanta, Georgia. And Atlanta is my home and where I come uh, during the offseason when I'm not playing football in the fall uh, for the New York Giants. Many people have asked me how I got started scrambling. Well, really, I think uh, it all started when I used to watch NFL football on television. And I used to watch the quarterbacks go back and throw from the pocket seven yards deep. And uh, if things were going right, they would throw the ball, get their completions, and usually their team would win. But if the rush uh, was getting by their offensive linemen or the receivers were being covered, uh, they just uh, would stay in the pocket and take the seven or eight yard loss. My philosophy has always been if... Uh, I have a rush and my linemen do break down occasionally, which all of them do break down sometimes, then I will uh, try to get out of the pocket and move around and try to find an opening and, and a receiver downfield and still get something out of the play. Tarkenton has the uncanny ability to escape from sticky situations and complete a pass or pick up yardage on the ground.
time he has the ball, he puts pressure on every defensive man on the field. With Tarkenton, the Giants had a new bold offense, had a new spirit, and the big town had a new star, the Scrambler. Despite his unorthodox style, Tarkenton has all the credentials of a true pro quarterback. He is quick and smart, and he's adept at picking up floating receivers in a broken pattern. He ranks among the top 10 passers of all time. In 1967, he threw 29 touchdown passes, a figure topped only by Washington's Sonny Jurgensen. But what makes Tarkenton the favorite of the paying customers is the fact that with him in command, every play becomes a dangerous adventure. Of all the quarterbacks in pro football, he is probably the best, with a football tucked under his arm. Fortunately for Francis, and the Giants, he is durable and sturdy, and always bounces back. He's susceptible to injury. Of course, when I run the ball, I still have the chance of of injury, but no more so, I think, than doing any other part of my activities as a quarterback. When I run, I don't try to be a fullback because uh, of two reasons. I'm not tough enough, and I'm not big enough. But size and toughness did have a place in the giant offense. The straight-ahead power of fullback Ernie Coy added strength and stability to the freewheeling New York attack. First season as a regular, Coy bulled his way for more than 700 yards and gained a berth on the Pro Bowl team. In addition to Ernie, there was hard-running Tucker Fredrickson, number 24. And newcomer Bill Triplett, number 38. And of course, old dependable number 40, Joe Morrison. Perhaps the most exciting of the giant runners was not a running back at all. He was a pass receiver. Split end Homer Jones, number 45. Homer's dominant characteristic is his speed which once enabled him to run the 100-yard dash in 9.3 seconds, win a gold medal in a U.S.-Russian track meet, and once defeat Olympic champion Bob Hayes in national collegiate track competition. Nobody ever remembers seeing Homer Jones caught from behind with a football in his hand. In 1967, he scored more touchdowns than anyone anywhere in the pro game and was voted New York's most valuable offensive player. After this 70-yard catch and run against the Redskins, Washington coach Otto Graham called Homer a truly remarkable athlete. He is. And so are all the others who led New York to a strong second-place finish in the Century Division. The Giants were a colorful and exciting team, one which drew over 450,000 people to Yankee Stadium. Some believe that it was the performance of Fran Tarkenton on this day against the New Orleans Saints that gave the Giants the extra incentive that stayed with them all year.
Tarkenton did so many wonderful things, so many wonderful ways, that New York piled up 535 yards on offense and scored once in every quarter. Francis completed passes up and down the field. He connected on 18 of 28 attempts, most of which went to Aaron Thomas, number 88, and to Homer Jones. Tucker Fredrickson and Ernie Coy complemented Tarkenton's passing game with a steady running attack. Coy, number 23, almost personally conducted the Giants on an early scoring march, gaining most of the yardage and the touchdown himself. Later in the game, Fredrickson got into the scoring column, too, with a three-yard burst over right tackle. Unfortunately, scoring came just as easily for the Saints. Gary Quazzo hit a hot streak in the second half and passed New Orleans into a 21-20 lead. Midway through the fourth quarter, the Giants launched their final attack, the sort of wild, daring attack that would become their trademark for the rest of the season. Tarkenton took turns throwing and running and did both well enough to confuse the Saints and move the Giants to the New Orleans 11. Just three minutes to play, Francis passed to Bobby Crispino for the game-winning touchdown. From 63,000 critics, the opening show got rave reviews. Sundays in New York were almost always happy occasions, as the Giants won five of seven home games. Possibly the most exciting victory came at the expense of the division champions, the Cleveland Browns. Early in the game, New York's hustling defense laid the groundwork for victory. They repeatedly gave the offense good field position and eventually opened the way for two touchdowns. An interception by veteran linebacker Vince Costello led to New York's first score. Rookie Ken Avery set the stage for the second when he blocked a punt, and Ed Wysikowski recovered on the Cleveland four. The offense followed both of these standout defensive plays with touchdowns. Fredrickson crashed through the middle for one, and Tarkenton ran 15 yards for another. But it was not running, but passing, that accounted for most of the New York touchdown. With tackles Willie Young and Charlie Harper giving Tarkenton fine protection, the Giants kept the ball in the air all day. And as the game progressed, it became apparent that Cleveland could find no effective measure to contain the Giant passing attack. With two Cleveland defenders covering Homer Jones on every passing situation, Fran turned his back on Homer and threw two touchdowns to Joe Morrison. When Morrison was covered, Aaron Thomas was not. And by the middle of the third period, New York led 35-17. But Cleveland was not about to roll up its rug and retire graciously. In the fourth quarter, 
Behind the powerful running of Leroy Kelly and the accurate passing of Frank Ryan, the Browns cut the giant lead to a single point. Tarkenton, not daring to turn the ball back to Ryan again, led the Giants on a short march into Cleveland territory. With ball control the key factor, he limited his plays to short passes and line plunges. The march faltered on the Brown 39, but Pete Gogolak kicked a 47-yard field goal to give New York a four-point cushion. In the waning seconds, the Browns drove to the giant 36. But there, Jim Cat Cabbage smothered a fourth down pass attempt, and Cleveland was a beaten team. Even the world champion Green Bay Packers experienced some pale moments in Yankee Stadium. In the first league meeting between the two teams since the 1962 championship game, the Giants surprised the Packers by dispensing with fancy frills and sticking to a ground-hugging possession offense. Ernie Coy and Tucker Fredrickson followed the open routes, cleared out for them by the crisp blocking of Greg Larson, Darrell Dess, Pete Case, and Bookie Bolin. After Coy and Fredrickson had softened the Green Bay midsection with strong running, Tarkenton passed over the Packers for two touchdowns. And at the half, the Giants led 14 to 10. They had the momentum, and against most teams, they would have gone on to win. But in the second half, Green Bay's defense lived up to its reputation, and its offense, which previously had not been able to move the ball, ripped through New York for five touchdowns and a 48-21 victory. In spite of the defeat, the Giants found comfort in the fact that no team scored more touchdowns on the Packers than they did. Nor did any team move the ball better against the Super Bowl champs. After the Green Bay game, the Giants went on to lead the league in touchdowns. And by the middle of November, the glitter and the glamour of Saturday night was far surpassed by the action and excitement of Sunday afternoon. Thousands came to see the football team. Fans came back to the rooftops to see and to cheer the most explosive offense in the NFL. On this Sunday against the Philadelphia Eagles, they did not go away disappointed. The first time the Giants had the ball, they scored on an 80-yard drive, which had its principal momentum, furnished by Ernie Coy and a new young running back, Randy Manier, number 27. Homer Jones scored New York's first touchdown on a two-yard pass. Then, two minutes later, he electrified the sellout crowd with a 63-yard catch and run for New York's second touchdown. The Giants went on to roll up 44 points their highest total of the year. But the most interesting figure on the scoreboard was Philadelphia 7, because for the first time in the season, the giant offense was augmented by an equally powerful defense. The New York secondary, led by Freeman White, number 81, intercepted three of Norman Sneed's passes. Part of their success was due to the firm of Katkavage, Condren, Calvin, and Lertzema, who put destructive pressure on Sneed and caught him five times behind the line of scrimmage. After this inspired performance against Philadelphia, the New York defense remained an important factor through the rest of the year. 
In the remaining games, names like Swain, Lockhart, and Eaton became just as familiar as Tarkenton and Jones. In the season's finale, the Giants beat the Cardinals, one of the toughest defensive clubs in the league, with their own defense. Bruce Anderson, number 79, and Roger Anderson, number 73, led a savage rush that held the Cardinals scoreless for three quarters. Quarterback Jim Hart spent a great deal of the cold afternoon in Yankee Stadium staring up at the overcast sky from beneath a half a ton of giant linemen. When he did manage to throw, his deep passing game was successfully curtailed by the New York secondary. Two of his passes were stolen. One by Spider Lockhart, number 43, and the other by Willie Williams, number 41. Meanwhile, the giant offense had rolled up 30 points. The offensive line, consisting of Larson, Des, Case, Pay, and Young, pried apart the St. Louis defense and permitted Ernie Coy and Randy Manier to grind out steady gain. The season ended as it had begun, with Fran Tarkenton filling the air with football. Two of them landed in the hands of Aaron Thomas for touchdowns. Homer Jones picked off another and carried it 69 yards to the goal line. The Giants closed out the year with a smashing 37-14 victory over the Cardinals. It was an appropriate finish to a rewarding season. A season to look back on with pride and satisfaction. For out of the darkness and despair of a last place finish in 1966 had come a new team in 1967, full of new names and new faces. A team of desire and determination. A team that fought its way up from the bottom to the first division, and in doing so, scored more touchdowns than any other team in the NFL. But of more importance than the cold statistics of the one loss column, was the fact that this was a team that would never stop fighting, never quit. In 1967, the New York Giants brought color and excitement to Sunday afternoons and offered victory to a town that loves a winner.